Ladies and gentlemen, game director on Path of Exile 2, Jonathan Rogers, also known as the gray-haired GGG god, was just interviewed live by the man in the vest, the savant of game design philosophy, the showcaser of games both good and bad himself, Josh Strife Hayes. This video summarizes their long, interesting conversation primarily about Path of Exile 2. A link to the full Twitch stream rests in the description. A link to the YouTube video will follow as soon as it is available. While of course watching this summary helps me and saves you some time, I would fully recommend giving the entire interview a listen the next time you're walking along the beach, hiking up a mountain, or just as likely blasting through some tier 17 maps, losing 60% of your way to level 97 in the Path of Exile in the Karabalus League. If you don't know who Josh is, he's quite the accomplished content creator with a suite of channels dedicated to games of all types. His core channel began as an MMO guide and then critique one, until it branched into doing reviews, video essays, and more, mostly about the gaming industry. He has a few sub-channels related to clips and long-form classic game reviews. All of them are excellent indeed. Jonathan Rogers, the focal point of this PoE2 interview, needs no introduction. You all know he is one of the three founders of Grinding Your Games, one of the most influential minds on Path of Exile 1's development, and the architect of all things Path of Exile 2. Talamoana, fellow exiles. It has been a bit. Let's talk some Path of Exile 2. First of all, this interview, while about Pee-wee 2, was quite rambly and beautiful, as to be expected. Ye have been warned. Question 1. How have the interviews gone so far? Super well, he could sit and talk about anything all day. And this is the Jonathan we know and love. Question 2. What is Jonathan bringing to the table with Path of Exile 2? He's always had an opinion of himself that he's just some random guy, just a youngster who happened upon a job in game development. When he was 10 years old, he wanted to be a game developer, but had absolutely no clue he'd wander into it. Even when they started grinding your games, Chris Wilson had the vision for Pee Wee 1, but Jonathan just wanted to be a game developer. He was a fan of Diablo 2, but it wasn't at the top of his gaming list. That was StarCraft, Final Fantasy 7, and Half-Life. However, now he is more experienced. It's wild. One of his favorite skills is having an eye to know when something is wrong. It is vital to have because if you have it, you can see when something is bad, remove the bad, and leave in the good. However, it's a tad unfortunate because when he plays games, all he can see is the jank. It's good for his games, but bad for him. Having all the pressure on him though is a bit scary. The game is absolutely massive, and it is the legacy of Path of Exile 1. It's on his shoulders, and it's a lot of pressure. That being said, they are not scared of shifting something that has been historic in PeeWee 1 to be different or work in a new way in PeeWee 2, and he is at the head of that. The hope with PeeWee 2 is that everyone will love all the new stuff, but there is a severe skepticism with existing PeeWee 1 players. For example, people always talk about slowing the game down and how that's a terrible decision. It's tough to address without people actually getting their hands on the game itself, which will come in good time. Question 3. What is on Jonathan's shirt? It's a design by a Pee-wee One fan, a totem based on the Kareri culture. It's beautiful, and his wardrobe now consists of hundreds of Path of Exile t-shirts. Question 4. How is Jonathan's day going? It's okay. It could be better. He's a bit sleepy, and he has a four-year-old. That's tough. Question 5. Why Pee-wee 2 instead of a Pee-wee 1 expansion? It's a funny story. They first asked themselves, what is the worst thing about Path of Exile 1? GGG said, it's melee combat. It's bad because it's hard to make melee skills. Well, it's hard because of the animation rigs which were made in 2007 and their super old assets who were made by a non-world-class animator. Additionally, each character had a different rig, so every animation had to be animated seven times. There was absolutely no reason for this. GGG just didn't know any better. The Templar also was left-handed. It was an oopsie. When they remade the rigs, they also had another issue. The beginning of the game looked old. Now they needed to do some art refreshes. It only took a bit of time before they realized if they're remaking areas, they should just make brand new areas. So it began as just an alternative act one, and it just kept growing until it became an entirely new campaign. At that point, it was Exile Con 1. The same game, two campaigns. Eventually, Everything changed so much, they just couldn't patch it in. 
so they needed to create an entirely new game. Peewee 2 is a cancerous growth that became its own entity. This is in Jonathan's words, not mine. Question 6. Could Jonathan beat Chris Wilson in a fist fight? No, he couldn't. Chris, when he was younger, did martial arts. He also goes to the gym now very frequently and is tall, so he'd absolutely crush Jonathan. Question 7. What is Jonathan's favorite class in Peewee 1 and Peewee 2? In Peewee 1, it's the Ranger because melee sucks. In Peewee 2, it's the Monk because it's the very first time grinding your games managed to get melee to not suck. However, every new class they make, that class hops closer to the top of the list. Their goal is to make Path of Exile until they have a game that is perfect in every respect. Question 8. How much game design time is spent on casual content versus hardcore content? Jonathan wouldn't stratify them into two groups, it's more of a spectrum. They could make a game that is difficult all the way through, lots of games do that, but they don't. They have a deep end game wherein they want it to be hard enough so most people don't get through it. Where should that place really be though? Maybe the end of the axe or some part in Endgame. He doesn't have a perfect answer on where it should be, but in Peewee 1 that point has crept up quite a bit and that has caused some interesting effects. They now have to design in a very certain way. Should the casual player be able to reach T16 maps or not? Right now, Peewee 1 goes from being relatively steady throughout in difficulty, then spikes massively at the endgame. How can they solve that? When going from one act to another, they think you should have a tension and release, except during Act 5 and Act 10, when you lose resistances against Kataba and experience a spike of difficulty and an increase in tension. The intention isn't screwing the player. It's the best way they can see to penalize stats without them becoming too bloated. They also don't want tons of formulas for everything. Not everyone is Mark 1, the encyclopedia of all PoE knowledge. He knows all the 50 to 100,000 stats in PoE with ease. It is wild and super difficult to QA the game, as seen with some of the strategies in the new PoE League. It was simply impossible to QA as some of the mechanical interactions were, honestly, forgotten about. Question 9. What video games has Jonathan played and stolen from for Path of Exile 2? It would be harder to make a list of games they haven't stolen from at this point. Jonathan plays a lot of games. For example, in Harvest, they looked at Harvest Moon and other simulators. With Delve, it was supposed to be Minecraft in Path of Exile. They completely morph at the end of development. More recently, Path of Exile 2 will completely steal damage numbers from Elden Ring. That's it. They'll have dodging, they'll have active blocking, and they have indicators for unblockable attacks. They also have some more hidden stuff upcoming related to this that Jonathan cannot reveal yet. He also elaborated on some insight from a Tencent rep who died at the Devourer and instead of going to fight him again, they went to farm loot and said if you're a loot game, you should be able to grind loot and then beat the boss. Jonathan argued they were both a loot game and an action game. Either path should be able to work, it doesn't need to be one. They do think some technical action game skill should be required to beat the game. Question 10. What has Jonathan wanted to talk about, but no one has asked him the right question yet? This is a hard question. Here we go. Why does PoE have classes at all? Initially, when they designed PoE 1, they wanted no classes at all. Dungeon Siege 1 was a big inspiration. The problem with no classes, though, is you have no concept of what to latch your character onto. If you give a player a stereotype, they can work it up from there. That's the purpose of a class, to have a stereotype to build a character on. Question 11. What systems bog down games and Peewee 2 rids of? Definitely not identifying items. The reason they have IDing in ARPGs is so you can double dip the dopamine. Something drops, what's it going to be, then you have a second moment of oh my goodness, what's it going to be again? It also relates to the game design quality of the near miss. You see the mods, you realize two of the three are good, and you could have had that third one, but it internally makes you feel good. It is hard to make it happen while you are fighting. They split it into the post-fight for the near-miss reason. In Peewee 1, the ID scroll isn't too great. In Peewee 2, there is an NPC who does it for you, and ID scrolls are rarer. If everything was dropped identified, you would remove the experience of finding and IDing something due to item filters. They would hide everything that doesn't relate to your character. Only good items would show. All the tension and suspense would be gone. By the way, Jonathan proposed and added item filters in the first place to Peewee 1. That's an awesome little tidbit. 
And leading into this question, Josh Strife Hayes kind of talked about the origins of identifying items and how people wanted to ID items because of Dungeons and Dragons and because some items were cursed. Well, most items were cursed and they affected your character in negative ways. And now it's antiquated. So that's what sparked Jonathan's response to this question. He couldn't think of a system that boxed down games and Pee Wee 2 rids up. So he instead went into the identifying items rabbit hole. But before we continue, here's a huge shout out to all my supporters on Patreon on YouTube and Twitch. You can support monetarily by checking out the links below or by liking this video, hitting the subscribe button, or sharing this content with your fellow exiles. Thank you all for your support. Now, let's get back to the video. Question 12. What's Jonathan's favorite game and why? As far as games he played when he was a kid, Half-Life and StarCraft. However, more recently, he likes the most polished experiences out there. Two games, Dead of War, which was super tight and had no jank, he loved his experience the whole way through it. It was perfect as there was nothing left to remove. Less was more. The next one was also very good, but not as good as that of War. And then the other game was Ori and the Blind Forest. And he is frightened they're now making a game in their genre. They being the developers of Ori. It's no rest for the wicked. Aspects of Ori were weak, like the item system, but nothing was bad. And that's what he cares about. Maybe there were bugs or jank, but Jonathan encountered none. He is quite keen on trying out No Rest for the Wicked, which hits April 18th. You see very few games in recent times without Jank. He is trying to push Pee Wee 2 to be the dad of war and No Rest for the Wicked quality. Jonathan has promised Pee Wee 2 will be a 2x AAA game. That's a 6 tuple A game. Pee Wee 2 is brutally overscoped. It is ridiculously crazy. They've said numbers about the bosses and monsters in the game, and it's just wild. When he thinks about Pee Wee 2's development, which began in 2017 and now they're in 2024, it's been going on and the amount of content made is insanity. A funny thing, the assets used in Affliction were used for Pee Wee 2 six years ago and were too old to use in Pee Wee 2 now, so they moved them to Pee Wee 1. <laughs> Ridiculous. Question 12. What systems has Jonathan removed from Pee Wee 2? It's hard to give a tight package for this question. A lot of it is an evolution. He struggled to come up with examples because many are arcane, like the way Leech works in Pee Wee 1 and how it's way easier in Pee Wee 2. Now, he didn't have any examples, but right off the top of my head, I can think of a few, and the biggest one is the socket in gear system. Removing that and the need to link various gear pieces and color them and not being able to really upgrade your skills easily was a huge hindrance to new players in Pee Wee 1, and that's not going to be the case in Pee Wee 2, wherein you socket gems into yourself and you don't need to care about the gear necessarily when it comes to your skills. Question 13. What's changed from original Pee Wee 2 designs to now? In some ways, nothing has changed. The overall design goal is the same. Make the perfect action RPG. Everything good from Pee Wee 1, nothing bad from Pee Wee 1, and have the combat be great. WESD though is a huge one. He thought it would be not good and it ended up being incredible. Question 14. Path of Exile 1 hates melee. Why? Well, he has five answers. One is the rig thing from before. It's harder to make melee skills than other skills. Animators hate them in Pee Wee 1. They take 10x longer to make, then you need seven copies for each class. In Pee Wee 2, there is one rig for all humanoid characters. This makes everything super transferable. In Pee Wee 1, most melee skills can be used by most melee weapons. That's another time multiplier. It kicks out the design for melee skills in Pee Wee 1 most of the time. Another detail is there are too many things in melee in Pee Wee 1 that you need to know to do that improve the amount of damage you're doing. Totems are one example of this. They essentially double damage. That is a hard problem to solve. How can you make this option exist and have people not need to pick it up? Well, the option is to have tons more options available in Pee Wee 2. Additionally, in Pee Wee 2, they also have different animations for when you are close and far away from a monster. This makes the attacks feel faster. Plus, targeting in Pee Wee 2. You do not lose control of your character like in Pee Wee 1. This can lead to longer attacks in Pee Wee 2 because you can change up your movement whenever. A lot of promises about melee in Pee Wee 2, and I do believe most of them. Question 15. What is the strangest design lesson Jonathan has learned in his profession? The fact that everything is game design. What are you doing when you design a game? You are trying to make things fun. If he posts some patch notes and they contain unexplained changes in them, the community can react badly to it, then they will have less fun in the game. But if Grinding Gear Games writes an essay, then there would be people who would have not had fun in the game that are now having fun. 
It's not game design by definition, but it serves a game design purpose. Reputation is also another one. Elden Ring has a reputation and that affects their game design. This means your game designer should be doing all these things, not just designing the game, but participating in everything, the marketing, the writing of notes, and so on and so forth. They should be absorbing all of it. Jonathan then touched on game journalism and the phenomenon of a game that ends up not being liked after release having a higher initial review score by game journalists. It's likely the experience the reviewer had. The same with the hype around a game release. It affects your enjoyment of the game and the scores it receives. Everything plays into it. The experience around a game helps tremendously improve your view of said game. Question 16. Will this communication continue once Wii 2 releases? Jonathan would like it to, yes. The hard part for Jonathan is not becoming jaded. He has periods when he is super active in the community. Jonathan was a Redditor before he was a game developer anyways, which is why he was so active in the community there. The trouble is it's hard to maintain that relationship when it feels like work. You can artificially engage, but Jonathan also wants to enjoy the experience. In interviews, a random person won't hop out and ruin Jonathan's day. On Reddit, that happens constantly. Over Christmas, Jonathan popped into the PV2 subreddit, then got busy. He enjoyed his time there. However, there can be a hundred great comments and one bad one that'll ruin Jonathan's day. It sucks. It sticks with you. He thinks, how can he change this person's mind? It is draining. These comments, though, are important. They have a reason for the comments. They do care, even if it's disingenuous. In an interview's context, it's not bad at all and much easier to speak about. With PeeWee 2, they never want to deny problems. They want to fix it all before the game hits. Have all the criticism come their way. They are open to change. Awesome to hear, and I really do hope he continues with this style of communication. Question 17. What games has Jonathan played and thought were bad, but had one system in which he thought that's fantastic? This is a tough question. The obvious one is D4. When Blizzard screw up though, grinding your games does not celebrate. It may sound trite, but it's true. Jonathan feels the pain they must be feeling. He thought Starfield was garbage. From the beginning, the plot was a problem, which is immediately concerning. He also hates when games put you in a mega city to start. Smaller hubs are better. The gunplay was bad too. The ship building was well received, and Jonathan liked it as well. They always start league conversations with boat building, and it's something they've wanted to do. In Wii 2, there is an island act, and you do have a boat, but there is potential. There's no certainty around boat building yet. Question 18. What measures is GGG putting into the game to keep players in Wii 2? One of the first videos Jonathan watched of Josh's was his short opening the Wii 1 passive tree. He knows it causes people to bounce. Jonathan was in favor of a fog of war on the skill tree before PUE 1 shipped. Chris Wilson was not in favor of it and was able to convince Jonathan to switch sides. The second idea Jonathan had was an unlock system for the tree in which you do endgame activities and the tree is opened up. For example, you kill 5,000 monsters with a sword and the sword nodes unlock. If it is unlocked on one character, then it would open up on all characters on the account. They felt that showing the full skill tree was the least bad option in the end if they wanted to go for something as complex as this. And now, since it is so iconic for Path of Exile, it cannot be changed. This is what Jonathan thinks, and therefore what the company thinks. They would like to set the expectation at the start of the game. It's sort of like not dying until you are level 30 in a game, then dying and bouncing. Instead, if you die early, you are aware the game will kill you. That's the way the passive skill tree is in Path of Exile 1, and Path of Exile 2. Question 19, why should someone play Path of Exile 2? Because it's a good game. That, that was the actual answer that Jonathan gave, and that was actually the final question of the interview as well. Thus concludes the interview between Jonathan Rogers and Josh Stripe Hayes. If you enjoyed the summary, please be sure to give this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out all the other interview summaries I've done, including one of my own interview with the gray-haired god himself. Anyways, that's all for this video. Talakura, fellow exiles.